Hey guys, on today's episode, we're working on this 2019 Aston Martin Vantage, and it's in here for a detail. Now, the backstory is, uh, this was sitting in a collection for many, many years, hadn't been detailed until a buddy of mine down the road actually purchased the car, brought it in here, and we're gonna clean it up. But what I noticed is a couple of factory defects that we're gonna identify and then remove. Now, at the very end, the owner gave us permission to drive this 503 horsepower twin turbo V8, and I'm dying to see what this thing can do. So that and a whole lot more on this episode of Drive and Protect. under the car, loosen the four lugs, lift the car a bit, and then remove the wheels. Now, I like to replace the lugs for two reasons. It prevents the cleaners from getting into the threads and allows you to easily clean them without them sort of wiggling around or falling all over the place and then losing them in the process. As you can see, the car has definitely been driven and for an Aston Martin, this is pretty dirty. But the main concern is that the paint itself has leftover sanding marks from the factory. This is typically indicated by pigtails or tick marks around the edges of the panel, as you can see right here. As you know, proper edge sanding can be more dangerous and definitely more time consuming than say the middle of the panel. So it tends to be the first process left incomplete in high volume manufacturing processes, such as an OEM vehicle. Pagani, Bugatti, Koenigsegg, and hopefully Glickenhaus being among the rare few exceptions with above average paint directly from the factory. Step one is to clean the paint to remove any contamination as working clean is critical in the paint perfection process. Okay, so real quick, uh, I've never really chatted about power washing a vehicle, but when you're power washing a car, in particular, you wanna see how the water beads off. I know that's a big thing. Is it beading, is it cheating? But from a polishing perspective, knowing that I have to polish this in a second, I, I need to know, is there something on this paint? Now, right now, to me, it's indicating there is something on here. That could have been a spray wax. That could have been a topper coating, or it could have been a real coating. So I don't have a clue, but at least in my mind, I'm going, okay, I'm gonna have to adjust a little bit of my polishing techniques and kind of figure out how long is it gonna take me to get through whatever's on top of it. If it's carnauba wax, that'll be pretty easy. If it's a ceramic coating, let's say, it's gonna take a lot more time. So as I'm power washing, I'm not just aimlessly kind of going like this. I'm also looking at the paint and how it's reacting and sort of getting my game plan for the rest of the detail. With that, I lifted the car completely to degrease the subframe with Titan 12 in my pivot bottle on the grimy areas. Lifting the vehicle can also help you work the back side of the wheels as well. Now, dry ice blasting is a lot of fun, but sometimes can be totally unnecessary for certain cars, such as this one here. The thought is, why kill a fly with a bazooka when you can do it with a fly swatter? I'll have a multi-part dry ice cleaning series coming soon to dispel the myths of when and when not to use dry ice blasting in your business, despite all the YouTube craze. With the undercarriage now degreased, I filled the foam gun with a few squirts of ammo foam and boost, then added a few ounces of water to the reservoir before coating the underneath of the car. This helps loosen all the trapped dirt from the tight spots with a bit of agitation before power washing the rest of it away. Take a look of how much stuff came out on the ground right there. On a car that was seemingly not that dirty. Look at that. With the car now down a bit, soak the top side before adding a squirt or two of foam to your bucket.
Inside the bucket, you should have two or three towels, depending on the size of the car, that will not be reintroduced to that bucket once they touch the paint. This method is the best way to avoid contamination scratches on your paint. Once all the dirt is gently agitated, then simply power wash again. Now, because the Vantage is on the lift, I cleaned the calipers, rotors, and suspension after I did the paint. Same thing with the door jams as well. When the car's on the lift, I can sometimes change the order of cleaning because the lift can make life easier, especially because I'm relatively tall. Okay, in most cases when you're doing door jams, I usually put a little bit of degreaser in there or some sort of pre-wash to kind of fight a lot of the road grime that gets into door jams, super common. In most cases, I will then take a power washer, pop off the little nozzle, right? So now it's just kind of shooting water. I'm not gonna do it in this case because uh, the whole thing is Alcantara, it's an Aston Martin, et cetera, et cetera. I don't wanna like jeopardize anything on the interior. So what you can do is put the, the nozzle back on the tip, close the door, then again, it, the car's all wet, so it's not like I'm re-wetting it. Then you take the power washer, and you can see how it's sideways or horizontal. Horizontal, vertical. So you're gonna wanna spray inside the door jams. Kinda like this. And do you see, it's starting to come out here. Okay, so when you open the door, you get most of it out. See, there's a little bit here. That makes sense to me. You can just take your towel and kind of do this little wiping. But overall, man, a little spot there. Overall, you, you got a lot of it. This is on the outside of the car, so that will come out as well. And in the seams, more importantly, if you jam the camera in there, you can see it's a little dark. There's no soap in there. So you could do both ways. You can put water on there, or if you're a little bit squeamish, or in my case, I just don't want to get a fully alcantara Aston Martin wet potentially on the inside and deal with that. Just close the door and use a little bit. See, it's a little, a little bit here, not the end of the world. Just wipe it up real quick and you're good to go. Once the paint is free of basic dirt and a little bit wet, I quickly clayed the surface with the same soap and water prior to drying the car after that previous rinse. In other words, if you're gonna clay the paint, don't dry the car, just use the same soap and water that you did before, clay the car, power wash again, and then dry it. It just saves time and chemicals during a full detail. I also needed to remove the factory clear bra. And if you remember from the Ferrari 458 bra removal nightmare with all the glue left over everywhere, this time we used our hot water jug to loosen the glue and remove the side pieces. Okay, the trick to this, aside from not burning your hands, is to try to get the water, the, the heat, uh, here as opposed to on the part that we've already exposed. And if you get it on this part by mistake, like if I pour it on top here, it just gets too hot and it rips through. But somehow you have to maneuver it this way, especially when it gets a little low. Kind of need to splash it to some degree and work quickly. Because once it cools off, it gets very stuck. You know, it, the glue obviously becomes hard again. So do this, work quickly. Come on. And don't be greedy, meaning you gotta stop. Because right now I gotta start over again, get it a little warm. Okay, then go again, because if I go too, too fast, it'll do like it did up there. I'll show you in a second. You see all the cuts in it too? That's what, that's what clear broad does right there. Now I'm getting towards the end, but I'm so close. Okay, come on, come on, come on. Like right now, I should be heating it up, but I'm, oh, see, that's what happens. <laughs> uh, I knew that was coming. So yeah, see what happened there? I tried to get a little greedy with uh, doing it too fast. With the bra now gone, to remove the remaining glue, I used rapid remover and a ton of patience. 
Now, on the driver's side, because I'm righty and I can pull with my right hand and pour with my left hand, it was much easier. The process was a thousand times faster and much smoother. Come on. Come on. Yes! One shot, baby. That's one shot. If you don't stop and you pour a lot on there, I don't know, I feel like that's a big win for me. Okay guys, on to the main event of the roof here. Now it has a ton of pigtails and sanding marks in the middle of the paint, but actually a bigger concern is around the edges. Why is that a concern? It tends to be thinner, you have less room to work. Uh, it's a little bit kind of scary working on that part. Now, as a detailer, we're saying, well, how can we remove this? We have two steps. We have one that's a little bit more simple and maybe one that's more pro or uh, weekend warrior type thing. The first one, pretty simple. You can take a microfiber towel or a microfiber little pad like this, use heavy compound. In this case, we have the course from uh, Rupes. It's a little bit, it's the heaviest version that they have. And you're gonna do it by hand. You're gonna wrap your thumb around and you're gonna work it in this tiny little area. The goal here, or the thing to keep in mind, is just like doing any other paint, uh, there's gonna be some residue coming off. And so as we blow out the pads, as, as if when I'm doing the big sections here, when I do a, a larger throw machine, we're gonna have to blow out the pad. Same concept here, we're not really blowing this out. Because we're only using our thumb, we're just gonna be constantly rotating the towel so we have a fresh towel with fresh uh, compound on there because you will be abrading away a little bit of that surface. So it's, it's kind of a, a safer, uh, more strategic approach, easy enough. Now, if you want to go at a little bit more pro level, you can use a, uh, a nano like this and shrink down the size. Instead of a big six inch pad or a five inch pad or a three inch pad, you can go down to one and two inch pads and strategically work these areas. Again, you want to have, you want to be a little bit more comfortable because the edges here tend to be a little bit thinner than of course the middle. So that's where that fear of like, oh my gosh, not only are there scratches in the middle, which, okay, we can get those out. They're on the edge. It, literally, it's like on the razor's edge. It's a little bit more challenging to get those out. But if you think about it as a slow and steady uh, pace or method to get just kind of lightly abrade these out, you can get them out. And it, it is a little bit scary, but uh, you'll be able to do that. So we're going to spend, I don't know, maybe the next hour or two playing with these and do the rest of the car. And it's going to look fantastic. Step one is to simply make your life easy and to tape off anything you don't want to damage, like rubber areas or trim pieces. So if you decide to tackle this by hand, use lots of liquid and rotate your microfiber towel often. Now keep in mind, this is not a quick or easy process. Your fingers are going to feel it if you do a large area, but as you can see from the before and after, it's worth it if you're going for perfection. Now it seems to be working pretty well, so I'm excited, but as you can imagine, uh, it took me, I don't know, three or four minutes just to do uh, a quarter size, like literally the size of a quarter. Is it terribly complicated now? Uh, you know, we're doing a little bit sort of like shoveling your driveway with a spoon. Is it hard? No, it's just a little time consuming. It makes you a little bit nuts. And believe it or not, there's actually detail shops, professional ones that, that focus just on that. Meaning there's one guy that's going around just doing the edges and another person that's doing the big flat area. So they work in tandem. And I've done that for years on, on crazy, uh, you know, show cars and things like that. Uh, but this is why, because this side will take me probably 30, 35 minutes just to do this. But you, you don't want to go too much crazy because you blow through the paint in one area, the whole job's done and it's not worth, you know, not worth the effort at that point. You just ruined the whole thing. So sort of like archaeology, you just want to do a little bit and then stop. That's kind of the, this beauty and this dance of doing these supercars and why it's kind of fun because it's a challenge. It's not just a normal car. There's always something interesting going on with these. Now, it's a little hard to see, but check the 50-50 shot right here. The before and after of the first round of hand polishing is actually pretty good. Now, if you have a lot of edges to do, you're relatively confident in your skills, and you want to avoid carpal tunnel syndrome, using a mini rotary with a wool pad can actually speed up the process greatly. Okay, so right now I use the little rotary, and in reality, this is what I'm going to be using and what I would use in the future, uh, but I did it by hand there just to kind of prove that it can be done. Now in this case, what you're gonna see, because this is a rotary and because it's wool, it worked really fast. It's like a thousand little hand motions in you know a matter of five or six seconds, right? But you are gonna get swirls like I'm seeing here, completely normal. 
And then I'm gonna go in with the big 21 and do all the big flat panels and I'll just kind of kiss this edge right here. I won't grind, I won't, I won't put this little edge in danger, but I will come by pretending this is my, my full size one. I'll come through and I'll just kiss it, kiss it. And just that alone will take out the little bit of wool pad swirls I put in, you're good to go. On the larger areas, I used my trusty 21 millimeter and a wool pad. And as you can see, the before and after is pretty obvious. There's swirls and tick marks over here and then totally clear over here. Once the paint was restored, I needed to touch up a few rock chips. To do this, I used the needle and syringe method. First, unscrew the paint lid and suck up some paint into the syringe. Attach the orange orifice and gently fill the voids with the paint. Remember, the goal here isn't to overfill everything and just splash it everywhere. Use the needle and the tip to kind of push it around, almost like a paintbrush. Just kind of move it around and you want a nice round surface. You don't want to use brush marks in this sort of respect. So this is where the needle can be really helpful. Depending on how deep the gouge or the scratch is, you may need to do this a few times because paint will shrink as it dries. Now with the paint drying, it's now time to play with the wheels. The next day, we reapplied paint protection to the freshly polished paint, allowed it to sit for another day before vacuuming up the interior and addressing a few stains on the Alcantara with Ammo Shag. The goal with Alcantara is to be very gentle and to use a bit of compressed air to sort of lift the fibers as much as possible once you're done cleaning. I also quickly cleaned the plastics and leather with ammo lather and a scrub pad, especially on the steering wheel, which quickly can become grimy from all the hand oils when you're driving. So regular maintenance in this particular area is key. Once done, I applied a fresh coat of Ammo Reflex Pro over the paint and the bra, leaving it incredibly well protected and insanely shiny. Remember to wait one to two minutes or until you see the rainbow and then wipe with a microfiber towel and most importantly, check over your work. When you're done, the shine will only get deeper and deeper as it cures within the next 24 hours or so. It'll go from a bit tacky to smooth in that time period, so do your best not to touch it too much as it sets up. With the sanding marks gone and Reflex Pro on top, the paint looked absolutely incredible when we were done. Well guys, we're all done. Now last night we put Ammo Reflex Pro on. As you can see, it's pretty shiny. When you put it on, it looks really good. The next day it looks even better. Why? Because it's cured. So at this point, it's cured. It looks fantastic. Now on a side note, uh, this particular color, what I'm gonna call burnt orange, I'm not exactly sure what uh, Aston calls it. I have a little bit of a soft spot in my heart for it. Uh, back in the day when Matt Farah and I started the New York Motor Club, uh, we had a burnt orange Superformance Cobra 408 Roush Big Block. Unbelievable car. So. Um, I have a little bit of a soft spot for this particular car and this particular color, just it's bringing back a lot of memories. Anyhow, we're basically done. It's got clear bra everywhere. It looks spectacular. Uh, the customer's coming in a little bit and he did on the, on the phone uh, tell me, hey, you wanna go out for a ride? So the episode's over, but uh, I don't know what's gonna happen. We're gonna take this out for a ride and see what happens. As always guys, thanks for watching. I uh, appreciate your support and uh, make sure you subscribe. Talk to you guys later. So much like the GT3, the center console has the tack, which I think is pretty cool on both sides. You have the temperature gauge and fuel range, and it sets up uh, you know, what mode you're in, track mode, sport mode, etc. We are in Sport Plus right now. And we got a little 
little shimmy on the way up there, so that's uh, definitely got some power to it. It's also a bit cold outside, which is to be expected with a car with 503 horsepower. But uh, nothing brightens your day or wakes you up enough. Driving a bright orange Aston Martin, getting on the highway, giving a little gas, and going sideways. Now, one of the most important parts of a sports car to me, especially if it is automatic and it has uh, shifter paddles, that those shifter paddles stay connected to the steering column, not necessarily the car. I like that idea. I like having that Ferrari is really well known for that. So I always know that the downshift is here, but if I'm turning the wheel, sometimes I think it can be a little bit challenging to find, maybe not for everybody, but I like them on the steering column. They're also ginormous and really, really light. Uh, these are really nice. Listen, that's real metal. Well done. I like that part, that's for sure. Once you get up about four or five grand and then uh, upshift, has a nice kick to it. The only problem is now I have to go back and clean the wheels. I just lit up the brakes and there's brake dust everywhere. Can't do that. So back to the shop we go.